Hey everyone, welcome back to VG News, your recap of the, well, biggest video game stories of the past week. We got a lot of Xbox stuff in here, some Nintendo, a little bit of Sony sales data, a whole bunch of stuff. I don't want to waste too much of your time, so let's just dive right in, because my gosh, we got to do this in one take today, folks. We don't have time for mistakes. Time to read from that script. The biggest story of the week is something that unfortunately was taken completely out of context, but due to the confusion, I think we need to go ahead and provide that context. That's because there's a wide belief right now that Microsoft is about to bring franchises like Halo and others over to PlayStation. But not just that they would go full third party, they would still have consoles, but they would be little side projects like the Steam Deck and even allow the side loading of Steam. Now, that sounds pretty industry shifting and several reputable outlets such as Yahoo, WCCF Tech and Gaming Bible are running stories and headlines that it's happening or at least rumored to be happening. Now, who's the source of all of this stuff? Well, that happens to be Windows Central's Jez Corden. Sure, he's actually a well-known insider and has connections. Windows Central, however, does not have a report up on this. Strange, isn't it? If he is breaking some story here, why wouldn't it be posted at Windows Central? Well, that's because it's not actually a rumor at all. It appears it all started at Reset Era, where a user named Tommy813 shared details from Jez reportedly on his Discord server. Okay, fair. Maybe he was revealing details to his community before a publication was coming out. I mean, that happens. Except, that's not actually what Jez did. I reached out to Jez Corden to ask what was going on, and he literally told me that it was all an opinion. Now, we ended up having a pretty fruitful conversation about the industry on the whole, and that was really nice of him. But here's the thing. It's easy to clarify all of this because I'm not a major reporter. I'm not a journalist, at least not anymore. I'm just a YouTuber, a Nintendo YouTuber of that, unrelated to Xbox. And all I did was reach out to Jez and ask, and he responded how easy it is to sometimes get verification or debunking some of this stuff. Now, the weird thing is that he did actually say some of these things on his Discord server, and Viloxis over on Reset Era even slapped together quotes from him on that thread. The problem is those quotes are little screenshots out of context, removing the actual conversation that he was having with another user on his Discord server. And the context of that conversation was they were just giving their opinions on the future of Xbox. You know, kind of like the same sort of stuff that we do on the Nintendo Byte podcast that he does on his Xbox podcast as well. Opinions. Opinions are typically not news stories unless they come from the very people making your video games. So the internet ran wild and at least on X, one outlet in particular, WCCF Tech, got checked by the community in a fairly easy way because Jez himself responded. That being said, what seemed like the biggest news story this week turned out to be a bunch of nonsense. Uh, so instead of focusing on his opinions, which we are all free to have, Let's get into some actual Xbox news, because yes, there is some big stories going on for Xbox right now. First, let's start with Phil Spencer and Xbox announcing the official Xbox showcase this June. He tweeted out, We're excited to share updates from our partners and our own creative teams across Activision, Blizzard, Bethesda, and Xbox Game Studios. Tune in at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on June 9th for the Xbox Game Showcase, followed by the redacted Direct. Now, notably, we can already tell that that Direct is about Call of Duty, and they're probably redacting it to save the full name of the game for to be revealed later. And the logo they're using for that redacted Direct, by the way, appeared in a Black Ops Call of Duty related leak a while back. If you guys happen to be interested in that, we're not going to go over all the details of that leak, but uh, that seems to be a really big deal, and that's maybe one of the biggest showcases happening this summer besides the Summer Game Fest stream itself. Now, there's one last bit of Xbox news this week, too, and that has to do with Starfield getting a highly anticipated update in an upcoming 1.11.33. That's the name of the update. They are adding some key features fans have wanted for some time. 
They are improving surface maps, a complaint fans have had since launch, though they don't actually detail what improvements they're making, and they are adding new ways to make different aspects of the game harder or easier per customized difficulty options for different aspects of the game the game. There are a few other things as well, but the biggest part of this update is to the display settings for the Xbox Series X. They are adding a frame rate target where you can now select between 30, 40, 60, or an uncapped frame rate if you have a variable refresh rate display, which most TVs don't actually support but is common with many monitors. They do note if you happen to have a 120 hertz TV, you will still get to choose between 30 and 60 FPS, though they wanted players to know that choosing 60 could cause screen tearing. Kinda strange considering 60 FPS is pretty standard on games all over the Xbox Series X without screen tearing. So definitely interesting how they're handling this particular game where it clearly was purpose built for PC first. That being said, they also entered a new prioritize mode. Here you can choose two simple settings, visuals or performance. The strange thing is this works in tandem with the FPS selector, not instead of. If you choose 60 FPS, they suggest choosing performance mode. Visual mode is basically what the game has been this entire time, and they suggest that if you have 30 FPS. They do note what visual settings change between these modes, but I think the strange part in all of this is how they are implementing this change. As someone who games on PC, I think instead they should do two things. First, have an advanced mode in the settings that allows you to just adjust everything, just like you are on a PC. I think that's simple enough. For casual users, just offer a visual and performance mode option and leave it at that. For performance, run it at a locked 60 FPS and auto adjust settings. Visual, enhance whatever and leave it at 30 FPS. Simple, clean, easy to understand. I think there could be confusion with some general consumers having to choose frame rates and a mode. And then for enthusiasts, not enough control to adjust the exact settings you want to get what you want. Again, it, it, it's sort of like we're almost there, but then we're not all the way. Also, by the way, hey, there could be screen tearing. That shouldn't even be a thing. I'm sorry. You should be able to fix that. Screen tearing does not happen in most console games. We haven't needed anything to fix screen tearing on TVs you could do something about this. It might take a lot of work. The, also, the weird thing about this story is that at one point when the game came out, they told us that 30 FPS is all you need, and the game was purposely designed that way, which was weird when it didn't launch at 30 FPS on PC. Just saying. A uh, bunch of malarkey. We need to go in and talk about the sales data that has now come out. Circana sales report has dropped for the month of March. And in case you forgot, this is the report that we formally refer to as the MPD sales report. They now release the reports at the end of the month for the prior month instead of in the middle. So you can expect April's report to be dropping on May 29th. That being said, let's dive into the details from Circana analyst Matt Piscatella. I won't go into every minute detail, but let's get to the bigger highlights. Overall spending increased 4% for the month, but this was largely thanks to a 15% growth in mobile content spending. There's a staggering 32% drop year over year in hardware sales. Now, the top 10 for the month of March were, this is just overall, were Dragon's Dogma at number one, Helldivers 2 at number two, MLB The Show at number three, Modern Warfare 3 at number four, Rise of Ronin at five, Princess Peach Showtime at six, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth at seven, Unicorn Overlord at eight, WWE 2K24 at nine, and Hogwarts Legacy at 10. Of note, Princess Peach Showtime, like all Nintendo published titles, does not include digital sales data because Nintendo does not provide that to them. We're also going to give you a quick look on screen here at what the current top 20 best sellers in the United States are through the month of March. Nothing really shocking on this list so far this year, though you can tell, at least from Nintendo's perspective, that it's a little bit of a down year software-wise, even though they've had something come out every month, because the only title that's even on this list for the entire year is Super Mario Wonder, which was their holiday title last year. So yes, Nintendo software sales are declining in the U.S. Now, the top 10 selling games, however, for PlayStation for the month of March show that MLB The Show 24 is on top, followed by Helldivers 2, Dragon Dogma 2, Rise of Ronin, Call of Duty, Rebirth, WWE 2K24, Madden 24, FC 24, and Spider-Man 2. Meanwhile, the top 10 for sales 
on Xbox were Dragon's Dogma 2, Call of Duty, WWE 2K24, FC24, Madden 24, Hogwarts Legacy, Minecraft, Elden Ring, Rainbow Six, and Jedi Survivor. Nintendo's top 10 includes Princess Peach Showtime, Unicorn Overlord, Mario Kart 8, Mario Wonder, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, Hogwarts Legacy, Smash Bros., Minecraft, Just Dance 2024, and Pokemon Scarlet slash Violet. Now, spending on hardware, as noted before, fell quite a bit, with all three platforms declining at least by 30% year over year. Overall, for 2024, all hardware sales are down 24% compared to the first quarter of last year. PlayStation 5, by the way, was number one in unit sales and dollar sales. Switch was number two in unit sales, but Xbox was number two in dollar sales. Xboxes are more expensive in general than Switch, so that explains that difference there. So that's sort of the update for you guys. Obviously, hardware sales are down. Uh, PlayStation, you know, is hoping to kind of boost those sales with the PlayStation 5 Pro coming out later. Nintendo, I would assume, is hoping with Switch 2 at some point, although it might not be in this calendar year. And then, obviously, Xbox is just struggling in general. We don't really know what they got going on besides maybe some refreshes later this year. All right, so let's dive even deeper into this now because we got to get to our next story that I'm only including, by the way, this is a small story, maybe one of the smallest ones, but I'm including it because I'm a Zelda fan, so I hope you forgive me here. It's a very minor update on the Legend of Zelda movie coming from director Wes Wall. Uh, and he did an interview with the direct and he stated the following. We're working on it. I think it's going to be great. Fans are going to be happy. Legend of Zelda to me is one of the most important things in my life. You know, next to Star Wars, I played Legend of Zelda throughout my childhood into my adulthood. You know what I mean? I am a fan. I am a fellow fan. I will go to the ends of the earth to make sure that it is a movie we all hope it will be. I mean, look, I warned you it wasn't going to be much of a story, but hey, it's the Zelda movie, and I can't help it when we do get news and it comes from the director. I mean, the news is, is, is what, that he's a big fan? I mean, I guess we already knew that. The news is that he's going to try to deliver. The news is that he's trying to make sure, he's trying to build faith behind the project. Look, he's setting that, the bar pretty damn high, so I guess we'll see what happens because I'm going to tell you right now, the literal makers of the Zelda games can't even find a way to please all the Zelda fans. So maybe don't set the bar so high because that's a bar that not even not even Aonuma can, can, can get over. Anyways, let's get into the next story. Here's another Nintendo story, by the way, the second one of the show, uh, that's making headlines and isn't surprising considering what it pertains to, but it's the number that pops off the page. Nintendo has successfully on GitHub taken down over 8,000 Nintendo Switch emulators and over 100 repositories of Switch emulator data. Nintendo even made a statement on this saying the reported repositories offer and provide access to the Yuzu emulator or code based on the Yuzu emulator. The Yuzu emulator is primarily designed to play Nintendo Switch games. Specifically, Yuzu illegally circumvents Nintendo's technological protection measures and runs illegal copies of Nintendo Switch games. Now, right now, it's nice to remember that Nintendo does actually legally own the Yuzu emulator at this point. So people should probably stop trying to make or create offshoots of that particular one. In my honest opinion, for me, the most shocking part is how many clones and offshoots actually existed. But I guess this is the internet, and I probably shouldn't be too surprised. Don't really want to get into a deeper conversation on if emulators are legal or not. Obviously, emulators themselves appear to be pretty legal, but whether this particular method of emulation, aka requiring decrypting encrypted files, is allowed legally, that we don't know. But doesn't really matter because Nintendo owns this particular emulator and they're just shutting it all down and GitHub is going along with it. Those DMCA claims are doing wonders for them. All right, moving on, we now have a PlayStation-related story, also a PC-related story. Unfortunately, not for positive reasons, and that kind of sucks. Helldivers 2 is causing a bit of a stir over on Steam today, as users are review-bombing the ultra-successful game over a big change that's being forced upon them. This has to do with account linking, and there's even an official update. See, it even looks all pretty on the paper. Let's go ahead and read this off. Attention Helldivers! Due to technical issues at the launch of Helldivers 2, we allowed the linking requirements for Steam accounts to a PlayStation Network account to be temporarily optional. That grace period is now expired. 
See details below in this post. Account linking plays a critical role in protecting our players and upholding the values of safety and security provided on PlayStation and PlayStation Studio games. This is our main way to protect players from griefing and abuse by enabling the banning of players that engage in that type of behavior. It also allows those players that have been banned the right to appeal. As such, as of May 6th, all new Helldiver players, Helldiver 2 players to be fair, on Steam will be required to connect their Steam account to a PlayStation Network account. Current players on Steam will start to see the mandatory login from May 30th and will be required to have linked to Steam and PlayStation Network account by June 4th. PlayStation Network accounts are free and easy to set up and use this link, yada yada. We understand that while this may be an inconvenience for some of you, this step will help us to continue to build a community that you are all proud to be a part of. Many thanks for your continued support of Helldivers 2, Sony Interactive Entertainment. And uh, let's just say people are not happy. However, it's understandable that most consumers do not read all of the fine print when buying a game because it actually said on the Steam page that this was required the whole time, but it wasn't actually like required at launch. So kind of weird, right? People have basically been able to buy this on Steam and not have a PlayStation account this entire time. So even though it said it was required, it actually wasn't and people don't read all the fine print. All right, so let's dive a little deeper. Game developer and popular content creator slash streamer Pirate Software explained the situation and the anger over it pretty well on X with the following words. Removing access from Steam players unless they make a PlayStation Network account and link it months after release is absurd. Review changed to negative and I have filed for a refund. For all those saying to just make a PlayStation Network, just make a PlayStation Network account, bro. If you've been playing Helldivers 2 and do not live in one of these listed countries, you cannot make a PlayStation Network account. Choosing a country you do not live in is a violation of Sony's terms of service and could lead to account termination. When pointed out that it's actually been listed on the page since launch, he had an understandable response to that as well. And it hasn't been enforced in any capacity until months after release and tens of thousands of sales to Steam customers, which will now lose access to the game unless we make accounts on PlayStation Network. You're not earning any points here. Now, at the time of recording the game, originally had a user score, you know, up in the 90s. Uh, now it's sitting at a 69. So people are pretty mad about it. Uh, I got to say that I understand the anger. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. You guys let me know what you think about this down below. Let's end with a couple of rumor style stories, beginning with Resident Evil 9. Reliable Capcom insider Dust Gollum had this to say over on X. I have good news slash rumors to deliver on Resident Evil 9. The possible delay I had heard murmurs about can be pushed aside. Resident Evil 9 should be revealed pretty soon and released next year. If what I heard previously holds true, that should be in January. It'll have been about seven years in development. January 2025, I hadn't heard now, just been a date I'd heard previously. They probably are still aiming for, but you never know in game dev. I won't leak or rumor any other details of the game. Just let Capcom do their thing and let them surprise people. So, hey, Resident Evil 9, baby. Village was cool. I'm really excited for this. Maybe even a Switch 2 version. I don't know at launch, but that would be pretty insane to me. Now, we got to get to our last rumor, which is a bunch of stuff thrown together for Switch 2. You guys might know if you've seen all my videos this week. If you haven't, well, here you go. Here's a summary of everything that you might have missed. We had a couple of rumors swirl with the Switch 2 this week, and the first were words from YouTuber Moore's Law is Dead, who claims he has a source at NVIDIA that told him that the docked performance of Switch 2 is aiming to be as close as possible to 4 teraflops, while the handheld GPU performance is under 800 megahertz for clock speeds. Of course, it would be nice if he would have just told us the teraflops. He told us, like, close to teraflops of one mode, but not the other. Kind of a weird way to put things out there, and some people are questioning if Moore's Law is that has any actual insiders at all, but we'll leave that at that. Uh, Sega and Atlas insider Midori decided to drop the goods that all the announced remakes, remasters, etc. Sega games that were dropped during the Game Awards last year are coming to Nintendo Switch 2. Now, those include franchises like Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, Shinobi, Golden Axe, and yes, Streets of Rage. All right, the rumors didn't stop there this past week with a report coming out of Korea from manufacturing that said the system could release as soon as holiday this year and Samsung won all the contracts from Nintendo including the display contract and that they might be going with an OLED screen. Then following up the Vandal report we put in VG News last week, 
More details seemingly came out of another accessory maker, Emoba Pad, who put out a giant blog post of stuff they told me privately is 90% correct. I actually don't know how to take that statement. Uh, but here's what the detail said. Old accessories are compatible, such as Pro Controllers and Joy-Cons via Bluetooth. There is full backwards compatibility, that's one of the big ones here, with the Switch physically and digitally, with Switch 2 cartridges not being able to fit inside the original Switch units we have today. The Joy-Cons are larger and use some sort of slotting magnetic system to attach using an electromagnet. There is also an additional button on the shoulders and one extra button below the home button. The screen on the system will also supposedly be 1080p. Then on top of that, Nintendo Insider Pioro did say that he had heard all of these details before from manufacturing, but that his primary Nintendo source was unable to confirm or deny one way or another these reports. Just that this information has been floating around behind the scenes. So not a confirmation of reports, just that hey, he has actually heard this stuff, as he just can't get it fully confirmed. Now, what any of this means, I have no idea. But that's all the Switch 2 rumors from the last week, and that's VG News. Kind of trying to keep it short and quick because I only had time to take one take of this bad boy to even get it out today. Uh, so hopefully you guys enjoyed VG News, and we'll be back at it next week, Friday. Friday.